Где взять жилье, если ты не жулье? Переселение, туш, кореш, это твое Ты не богат рублем, зато не подводит чутье Придется взять то, что почти ничье В России жгут обычно те, кто не есть гуд Деньги текут кулкам, что не обезобразил труд Цены растут, вызывают For me it all began with half-life, the half-life of this empire, and the half-life of my past life that I couldn't have known would end the way it did for a new life to begin. People often ask me why I study video games and digital media, and the simplest answer is because I read books. There's one hallmark of the digital era it's the dramatic expansion of texts and text production and reading of all kinds. To the point that the internet remains very much a gigantic library, the library of all of our libraries. Corporate atriums may dominate our architecture, but libraries are our future. Here's a view of the Quad, the city center of the University of Illinois, as it were. It's the strange fate of universities to be older than capitalism and yet newer. They began as hieratic institutions and were gradually democratized over the centuries though with great difficulty. The U.S. built some of the world's finest and most accessible public universities in the mid-20th century, part of the living legacy of progressivism and the New Deal. Since the 70s, though, neoliberal capitalism has been trying to privatize and corporatize universities to hell and beyond. Not so long ago, the square that you see was full of graduate teachers. We went on strike for a couple days in 2009 to defend our tuition waivers. And we won! Because it says something about how much damage neoliberalism has inflicted on this planet that we graduate teaching fellows. And we're one of the most privileged and select groups in the world. We had to create a labor union in order to protect ourselves from the locusts of Wall Street. Here at the Institute for Communications Research, my home base, our main job is drawing maps, not of buildings or cities, but of media systems. We figure out how media work, who they influence, what stories they tell, and what social interests or unsocial interests they serve. There's a great moment in Patrick McGowan's 1967 TV series, The Prisoner, one of the greatest science fiction series ever made, when he discovers the only maps available are ones which show the village, the high-tech prison he's trying to escape. Our job as media scholars is to make maps. Not the kind which show borders, but the kind which cross borders. Ah, the academic tuxan. It's all too easy to think of universities as playgrounds for privileged elites. The much less glamorous reality is that we work like hell in what amounts to just another branch plant of the global factory. Of course, as factories go, Gregory Hall is quite beautiful. Just around the corner is our billboard, our shrine to the old media. It always amazes me just how productive the graduate students and faculty members of ICR are. You need a satellite navigational system just to keep up with the scope of our research topics. Every aspect of the mass media, including a few which haven't been invented just yet. Of course, if you ask folks at ICR why they do what they do, the first thing they'll say is, well, we just report the news. We don't create it. Normally, the halls are overflowing with students Today, not so much. End of the semester and all. You'll note the stairs up to the grad lounge form an Escher-esque pattern of an eternity of falling and rising. I often think the early 20th century built staircases the way the late 20th century built atriums. The parade down the former is the light show of the latter. Now that said, there is something special about these stairs. No, not there. And no, not there either. Aha! Video gamers in the audience will know this reference. Back in 1998, a small startup in the Pacific Northwest created an entire franchise based on pipes and industrial infrastructures. The company's name was Valve, and the franchise they created, Half-Life.
the end of Half-Life, there's a great cutscene, which I have paraphrased in my own words. Gordon Freeman in the flesh. Or rather, in the graduate program. I took the liberty of removing your textbooks. Most of them were university property. As for the tuition waiver, I think you've earned it. The Game World, Zen, is in our catalog, for the time being. Thanks to you, quite a nasty piece of work you managed over there. I am impressed. Apologies for my atrocious voice acting, but Half-Life did more than just foreshadow the planetary catastrophes of neoliberalism. It also gave us the first anti-neoliberal hero, Gordon Freeman. What made Half-Life different from any other alien invasion thriller is that you are not a super soldier or an imperial centurion. Crowbar in hand. Or was it a cappuccino? The script, created by Mark Laidlaw, cast Gordon Freeman as the hero of an interstellar anti-colonial resistance movement. An ordinary scientist who has to join with anti-colonial humans and aliens in the fight for survival. The battleground? The scientific and military infrastructures of the Cold War national security state. This was something new in video game culture. Putting the planet first, and the U.S. Empire second. Valve's logo is one of those fascinating documents of video game culture which points in several directions at once. It's a quotation of French surrealism which was fond of blurring the line between bodies and machines in explosive and often unsettling ways. It's also a quotation of Nintendo's Mario. It's always exploring giant pipes and defeating monsters with a suspicious resemblance to real estate moguls. I would argue Freeman's signature tools, the hazard suit and the crowbar, are to the anti-neoliberal resistance very much what Charlie Chaplin's threadbare hat and cane were to the progressive movements of the 1930s. Symbols of labor, but also class dignity. Not that most media professionals or culture workers would openly say such a thing, of course. The contradiction for media scholars is that we're part of the system we're trying to investigate. It's not just that you shouldn't trust the media industry. You shouldn't even trust yourself. It's why the first and most essential step in critiquing the mass media is critical distance. It's only by moving from the history of the media to the history in the media that we open a path to the future.